Um, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to Versatile Data Kit uh, community meeting. I believe, uh, yeah, this is maybe 10 or 11 meeting. I lost the count already. Um, uh, this 22nd of February, and uh, I'm going to quickly share our agenda today. Um, can you see my screen? Yep. So on the plan on the menu today, we have a VDK Let's release, as we usually do, uh, VDK Jupyter integration that uh, Duigo is working on. And uh, then we will share, I have prepared a little bit of uh, slides uh, and uh, about my experience and conclusions from FOSDEM uh, conference that happened uh, on um, 3rd and 4th of uh, February, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, then we just uh, need to kind of agree on the next meeting date. And uh, that's the plan. And uh, if you have anything else to add, maybe the time is a good time now. But also, I believe that we're going to have like a full meeting with this agenda. So um, I just want to quickly introduce first our date kit. If someone's watching this and uh, you don't know what it is, Basically, it's a framework uh, to build, run, and manage uh, data pipelines uh, with Python uh, or SQL. And uh, yeah, it uh, takes care of uh, ingestion, transformation, and export part of the um, data processing. Uh, it, and besides uh, uh, ETL uh, or ELP um, part, it also covers the infrastructure. Uh, so basically, it is uh, taking care of uh, what uh, data engineers do, like uh, data pipelines and the uh, management of them, and also orchestration, and also setting up uh, the, the cloud infrastructure and, and managing the jobs uh, on Kubernetes environment. So that's in short, uh, what is VDK. Mm. And now I will quickly stop sharing uh, to kind of introduce uh, who is today on the call. Uh, my name is Akita and uh, I'm the community manager. And I see also that uh, we have two team members that have joined recently VDK. And uh, I think one by one, we can just introduce ourselves and then we can start with the agenda. Whoever feels, feel free to, to go. Hey, my name is Daco and I'm a former member now of the VDK team. And I'm also a current user of the VDK and I'm responsible for the VDK deployment in VMware as part of our data analytics platform. Thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Gabriel. I've worked on VDK for almost two years at this point. And yeah, I think that's it. Okay, hey, um, my name is Dylan. I've been, uh, I started contributing to VDK um two or three weeks ago i'm a new team member so just looking forward um to more great features hello my name is yuan and i'm a member of the vdk team for now three days that's my third day so i'm excited to see in the future of vdk hi my name is Ivo. Uh, work on VK for probably around three years now. Um, one of the most interesting things we did on VK core was fully managed connections, database connections. And I've worked on some VK plugins as well. Um, now we are in the process of open sourcing front end that is a web application to um, interface with data job management. If you don't, maybe someone else can take off. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Hugh. I'm not part of the VDK team, but I used to work uh, closely with some of the folks of the VDK uh, team, and I'm just a supporter of the project as a whole. So yeah, you are also like a contributor a bit. You already gave us some review, and I'm actually working on documentation improvements on the feedback that was contributed by you all. Well, not that I help. Hmm. 
Um, but we cannot hear you, Stan. Name is Stanley Stan Sam. <laughs> I'm also a contributor to the team uh, and manager for some of the folks. Uh, and I'm in the team for the last six months or something. Yeah. Okay, I'm Antonio Vano. I'm one of the creators of EDK, the only one who's still working on it. Uh, yeah. And uh, thank you. Hello, I'm Doigo, and I waited for everyone to introduce themselves because I'm the one who will be talking now. So I have been working for here for like eight months and I have been working mainly for the Jupyter integration of VDK and um, so I want to go through the web of Jupyter integration to describe it better. If you don't know what web is, it is versatile data kit enhancement propos proposal, which is a document that gives more information for the new feature, new plugin you're adding to VDK. So um, you can find the web of Jupyter here in specs. Over here, there is a video of the UX flows that we have now. And yeah, let's go through the web. So what was our motivation for integrating VDK with Jupyter? So as you know, or might not know, uh, the only interface we have for VDK currently is the CLI. And we did some research and yeah, it, it turned out that most of the people who use VDK, who are data scientists, data engineers, et cetera, don't like using the CLI that much because they don't like have much experience with it. And yeah, after that, we came up with the goals to provide a, a UI for the for VDK that is like an optional option. Another option, like you can choose whether to use CLI or the Jupyter UI. And yeah, we did other research with people who use Jupyter and we came up with a table that explains most of the problems which VDK users and Jupyter users have. And yeah, as I said, the main problem of VDK users is that they don't really like working with CLI. So it is a really big problem for them. And another problem is that currently they work with IDs such as PyCharm, IntelliJ for um, creating data jobs and they don't find them that convenient for working with big data. And yeah as well as for testing when working with big data. Some problems we found out about Jupyter is that moving to production from notebook files is pretty bothersome since I don't know how many people are quite familiar with uh, Jupyter notebooks, but there is a lot of code that is not meant to be there, just like prints, etc. And yeah, other problems our users fa are facing is that they need to rerun a whole job for small changes in it, or like rerun a whole job for a failing step. And another uh, problem the users pointed out is that sometimes there are too many SQL files in a data job because there can be just one query in a single SQL file. So after that research, our goals were to provide our users a easy access to Jupyter Notebook that is integrated with VDK, 
provide a UI experience which will decrease, as I said, the use of CLI and the solution should be installable. The solution should provide a way to rerun failing changed steps like without having to rerun the whole job and yeah, the number of SQL files that are needed for a job to be minimized. And here, here is a high level design of what we, what our solution is. Um, so our solution consists of three new components. One of them is a JupyterLab extension. One of them is a VDK plugin. And the last one is IPython extension. And um, yeah, we use the JupyterLab extension. The JupyterLab extension consists of a front-end extension and a server extension. The server extension is used to connect with VDK, while the front-end extension is to provide some graphical elements such as menus, buttons, etc. Since we will be working with notebooks from Jupyter, uh, we needed a new way of parsing, reading that notebook since with uh, Jupyter notebooks work with IPython while VDK works with Python. So we cannot directly run the job from uh, from the notebook. So that's uh, what VDK notebook plugin solves. It introduces a new way of parsing a data job, let's say. And the last one, the IPython package extension, it, we use it to, uh, to provide, to load a data job to a single notebook instance. So our user can work directly with a initialized data job within the, the notebook. So here come the, the UX flows. So instead of uh, reading those stuff, I will do a quick demo of some user flows. And yeah, let's go. I want to point out that all this stuff that you will see now is still being developed. So the last product we have might, might not look exactly the same, but yeah, it gives a brief. Mm, it gives an idea of what will the job, Jupyter integration be. So as you see here, we have a VDK menu in the Jupyter navigation bar. In the, in the menu, we have run, create, delete, download currently, which are the VDK run command, create, command, create job command, delete job command, and download job command. And instead of, um, so if our user wants to run a job, instead of opening the terminal and writing VDK run, blah, 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 he would go to the VDK menu, go to run, and here he gives the path to the job. I will run this REST API job. And just fix the OK button. He should wait a little while the job is running. And after the job is ready, he gets the alert that job execution has finished with status zero. And to see VDK logs TXT file for more, we come here, we see the standard logs from, we get from the terminal, if we run the job from the terminal. So yeah, for example, to create a job, he comes here and let's create a local job with name, sample job. Um, team sample and where to create it. And okay, so I get the alert that job with name sample job was created. And let's see, as you can see, it is here. 
it is the standard job we get, standard sample job we get if we run VDK create. And yeah, I would say that's all for now for the graphical elements. And let's go into one data job, how it would look like. So here I will show the, let's say, Jupyter version of this job from our examples. Um, so here we have a job that is ingesting data from REST API job. And currently, the job would look like that. So we have this directory and in the directory, we have a SQL, two SQL files, one for deleting a table, second for creating the table and one Python file for doing the ingestion. So that is how what each file would include. As you see, drop table, query, create table query and yeah, the Python code. Um, initially, OVDK uses the deferent job, job input function. Like if you do not include this function in your Python file, it will be ignored from VDK. And uh, in the function, we do the actual ingestion here. And let's see how it would look in a net notebook. Um, so I'm pointing out again, this is work in progress. So this stuff might look totally different, but yeah, here comes and use the VDK IPython extension, which as I said, is needed to load a data job in a notebook. Firstly, we need to load the actual extension in the notebook. This command is used to load extensions in a notebook. Let's run it. It's run. So what VDK uh, IPython does is that it introduces a new magic command for Jupyter. A magic command is like a command that has this uh, symbol and does directly something if you run it as I said, in Jupyter, let's say. And yeah, let's run it. And yeah, it gave me some object. I don't know what it is, let's say. And yeah, this object is actually data job. And like when I run this command, it creates a global variable, which is named data job. And it is the data job for the notebook. And yeah, if you want to see the data job, actually I get the same exact same thing as here yeah so to work with vdk i to work with the data job i need to the job input variable to get it i still use that variable say data job start and yeah i get a initialized job input variable here you can see it and now i can use the job input variable to execute some queries before executing them, I will show you. Let's see whether I have something here. Yeah, I have a table that is uh, created and ha have some information in it. Let's use the job input variable firstly to drop that table. We run it. And yeah, that table is automatically deleted. So there is no such table in my database. Now let's create it. The cell is ready and we come here. Now I have a table that is actually empty and let's ingest some data in it. Firstly, I need to re import requests to use it. So I get the data from here and yeah, let's load the payload. This is the data I have and to ingest it, as I said, I use job input variable and send data for ingestion and just run it. 
And yeah, as you can see, now the data is loaded in the table. And yeah, that is how would our user work with uh, with DK in a notebook? What it what function uh, what functionalities it provides us is the thing that let's say he doesn't like that data. He didn't want it exactly the same pay, payload. He can just like delete the table easily again, just turning that cell and do all the stuff he wants again and again. And after everything is done, he can just come here, add some tags to it and, and everything is ready. So let's, talk about this text. Um, as I said, the notebooks have a lot of unneeded information as this. Like, I don't really need that cell for the data job to be run perfectly. It is just for me to see what data I am using and it should not be executed if we want to run the whole job. What is needed to be executed is to have something that drops the table, have something that creates the table, and yeah, this Python stuff that is that are needed to load the data, like this, 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 but not this. As you see, I have not put a tag to the ones that I don't want to be used. And yeah, oh, this is where VDK notebook comes, the plugin for parsing a notebook. So what a VDK notebook exactly looks for is these tags. So VDK notebook gets the, uh, the code only from the cells that are tagged with VDK and all other stuff is ignored. As I said, VDK works with Python while notebooks with work with IPython. So all the IPython stuff like reloading extensions and stuff are not part of uh, the job initially, initially and should be ignored. And yeah, that's how the notebook extension helps with. And I think that's all. And let me just go back to the web and give some more information. So the web includes more detailed information on those plugin extensions and stuff, but I won't mention them since it would take too much time. If you're interested, you can go to the web and read it. If you have some information, you can text in the Slack channel. And yeah, I think that's all. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, I'm oh. sorry, can you repeat it? Yeah, I, I do have two questions. Uh, first, uh, where do we see the Jupyter integration to evolve in the future? Do we have any plans for it? Um, yes, of course, but hmm, good question. So we plan to get a better ver version of it working in three to four months, I suppose. And yeah, we want, as I said, as I mentioned in the start, we want it to be the second option that our users have like when they want to work with a VDK, like not to enforce our users to use CLI and to for some to learn it, to learn how to use it. They would easily have the other option of having a UI that is pretty easy to use. And yeah, many data engineers are like almost 90% of the data engineers know about Jupyter. So I think it wouldn't be hard for them to learn how to use VDK 
using Jupyter instead of the CLI. I don't know whether it gives an answer to your question though. <laughs> I yeah. can even, uh, give a bit more holistic view, uh, basically on the roadmap. As um, Eva said earlier, we are actually progressing well on one other activity like open sourcing the operations UI, but uh, operations UI without um, uh, IDE integrations that work uh, for the uh, for the data engineers, data practitioners. Um, of course, it's useful, but it's not uh, as useful as uh, the direct ID integration would be. So, um, so that's why we're investing in the Jupyter uh, integration uh, first. Um, that will have, I would say, quite a, a number of usability enhancements. Uh, the good just uh, showed, let's say, the first batch of the stuff. I believe a lot of a new and cool stuff will come so for sure it will be in the in the product in the project in the next uh, three to six months that's that's in the roadmap so if i may uh, also add um, a point uh, it seems to me that uh, the jupiter integration is focused on uh, developments uh, and developing vdk data jobs and the front end is focuses around uh, managing workloads like uh, in pro they're running in production, they're running uh, like a process of the workload itself. <clears throat> and my second question is, would it actually make sense if we turn a whole VDK job into one like uh, Jupyter style thing where all the steps are actually different cells and you see all of them sequentially. Is, is this planet or what do you guys think about it? So generally, yes, this is a whole like data job over here. I don't know whether you remember, but in the start I ran a job, it was the same job here. So what we get in the logs is that every cell that is executed is a um, data job step. And um, so in the previous, in current VDK, every step is kind of like, we get logs for every file. Meanwhile, we get here logs for cells, which is, I think, which is kind of cool because you get more information for the um for exactly where your problem is like in which line and stuff and yeah more like i see like a notebook is a big step and it has like sub steps in it let's say a big vdk step that is a notebook mode maybe i don't know <laughs> was uh, the yeah, uh, in addition to this so basically, uh, the question that Ivo is asking, I believe, is related to, uh, I would say, migrating from one style to the other, let's mm -hmm. say, having uh, uh, a classic uh, VDK uh, workload and transfer it, uh, transferring it to a, a notebook, etc., and vice versa, of course, um, it, uh, all those stuff are planned uh, to be implemented. Uh, we, of course, we first want to run some user tests and double check how the, the users of VDK and no, uh, Jupyter would like to see those stuff happening, either automatically on opening or running some wizards, different options uh, that we'll explore. But for sure, these uh, migration steps uh, between the, 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 the use cases will be, will be provided. But that's a great feedback. Thanks. Um, I have a quick question. I just, uh, because we had the conversation actually on LinkedIn, I think with uh, Ivo about uh, creating a table. So I, I believe that uh, with VDK, it's not necessary to specifically input this job input create table. It will create a table even if it doesn't exist actually without this step, correct? Depends on the project. 
so we can different plugins can support different databases uh, and uh, depending on the maturity of the plugin some of them support our inference which means they will automatically create table like test right the test screening others not so check out the plugin documentation pretty clear Um, um, probably not um, questions. I got some notes during the presentation. By the way, it, it was very useful for me to visualize the current state. And I found very useful uh, how you can evaluate particular elements of your data job or steps. Uh, one thing that maybe I would uh, ask for elaboration is um, when you create a data job by clicking VDK menu and then create, and then providing the name and where to be stored uh, by template, you produce a sample data job to start like a scratch path to start from. And this data job is consists of SQL and Python steps and some uh, descriptive ini file, a readme that provides text and information for the user and requirements text it contains the dependencies of your uh, data job workflow. Um, <clears throat> so how does that relate to a notebook? Uh, is the notebook translated later to Python and SQL? And should we be producing a IP, uh, P, Y, and B file uh, when we create a data job? Or could you explain more on, on this? Uh, so the initial idea is, uh, when we create a data job from, uh, from Jupyter to get a sample job, include, including a notebook, it's just isn't impl implemented yet, but it will be implemented. It isn't to do, let's say, I just here use the current version of create job, but as I said, a sample notebook will be added instead of this. So this would be the connection to the notebook. Great, uh, thank you. And one more question. I found very useful that you can include some particular steps, for example, functional one for creating tables and ingesting payload. However, there are some, uh, let's say development helper steps, for example, printing some output during development to understand better your development uh, work in progress. And you may potentially don't want to include those in the end production data job. So you don't tag them. However, um, is it possible and may be frequent so that people just um, miss to tag something that is really important? And it so happens that um, the data job goes to production and uh, there is some missing step and they need to troubleshoot further and eventually uh, realize that maybe they uh, need to tag an additional cell. Uh, so we have the idea of running a data job before like putting it to execution. So, um, now I will be adding the deploy bit button here. So before that data job goes to production, it will be run once. So the user will have for the last time, see like what he gets. So he can double check whether it does exactly what he wanted or not. If it doesn't, he can go back and check. But I see like, I see some, uh, drawbacks of these tags because as you said it's really easy to miss something and yeah it might further be discussed like and maybe add some other graphical elements that visual that visualize that some cells are tagged and some are not tagged more yeah. easily more visible to her uh, while developing what is tagged and what is not with one side to the entire notebook instead of clicking each cell and browsing to see if it's tagged or not. Yeah, maybe the tags, the tagged cells can be a little bit 
changed in color or something like that. Like we have that idea of getting something more visual instead of this text. But yeah, currently we just have the VDK notebook is just in its, uh, working with the text. But yeah, it, I would say it's rather an enhancement to the whole UI. So it would be better to have a UI that is working correctly, firstly, than to do these little enhancements for accessibility. Yeah, a little bit very important. I couldn't hear you, sorry. Oh, I said they are little, but very important, critically important. True. <laughs> Oh, I guess one idea that just popped in my head that I think would be useful for the users, instead of uh, really running the, the whole job in some real environment, maybe you can guys introduce uh, some form of uh, mocking, of data mocking functionality that runs uh, locally in this uh, Jupyter. So you can run it with uh, some sample data and just see if the output will match what is. Uh, generated or maybe what you entered and uh, then deploy. I don't know if this will make sense, but I think it might be useful. Yeah, we are thinking about how to make testing data jobs easier and uh, challenge actually testing data jobs that will be developed in our book. Uh, data engineers can so many engineers can prefer in our book, but testing in our book is a challenge. Uh, Anthony, it's very quiet when you're speaking. Yeah, we are thinking about how testing uh, testing data jobs and testing the notebooks even going to be a bigger challenge. So yeah, we'll be thinking about those ideas. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, if there are no further questions, uh, I guess thank you, Togo. I see that uh, Gary has joined us. Um, and uh, actually, I wanted to introduce a little bit uh, Gary to the rest of the team. I hope you can hear us. Uh, Gary actually is uh, one of the contributors and the main reason, or like um, the main contributor to our uh, README file at the moment. The way that it looks, uh, it's uh, completely remade, kind of, and uh, uh, restructured and uh, rewritten by Gary. So, yeah, Gary, hi, and uh, maybe. Say a couple of words. <laughs> this is the uh, theme. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's morning here for me. I'm uh, located in Canada. Um, so it is uh, 1041 a.m. Uh, our time. Um, yeah, happy to happy to be here. It's really great to be part of this group. I'm kind of excited about that Jupyter Notebook uh, feature. I think that'll be really great. Um, I've used Jupyter Notebook in the past, so it's uh, it's kind of exciting to see that integration. Uh, I'm a technical writer. I've been in IT for 15, 15 years, um, a lot in the Windows world of uh, server, administrator, network, firewall uh, area. And um, I recently, in the last three, three, four years, started doing a lot more technical writing. Um, and so I've worked with a couple other open source groups. Um, Project Contour uh, was another one. Um, and uh, I saw a post for this one, so I thought, uh, Kind of interesting to see what uh, VDK is all about. Um, so great, great to be here and uh, happy to uh, try and help out. Thank you. Okay, so I think that we can jump into actually release. Uh, um, Tony, are you ready with the release notes? Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, very cool. Uh, yeah, uh, if we yeah, uh, if we do, uh, we do sort of release announcement every month. Uh, technically, every single plugin and. Uh, the core components are released automatically 
it won't get all the checks and pass and test uh, but uh, this filter also tends to uh, provide the uh, overview of what happened to the last one uh, so I created very recently the latest release which name is 0 0.11 and uh, some of the major new features uh, which include are uh, we have a, a new contributor entirely new uh, who is not here on the call Stefan, Stefan Boldor uh, who introduced uh, POC for introducing data quality checks Basically, they want to handle the problem where uh, uh, they have multiple processing jobs where they are transforming some data using SQL, using uh, versatile data kit templates. And uh, the problem was that uh, uh, when the data view and the, the, uh, there are some quality check, uh, they would like to be able to stop the processing so the data in production in the final target table is not polluted uh this kind of point in time checks quality checks uh or a, a new feature and currently i edited the poc to only one template the quality and image type one template uh provided this is successful we'll get one to generalize we to get a generalized approach basically the quality checks looks like the example here uh when they are writing uh using some template uh, they just set new argument called check and a function that uh, specifies the check. Like in this example, if there is a bet in the table name, it's uh, written as false. Uh, in the, this, fun this functionality could be used potentially to have already integrations, more advanced quality tools like great expectations, so, so on in the future, uh, if when, it, when it's generalized. Uh, the next uh, rather contribution that we want to note is uh, some improvements in our in the Jobs Query API. Uh, Jobs Query API is a GraphQL based API that allows you to uh, basically inspect and uh, browse information about data jobs, data jobs deployments, data job executions, yeah, everything around stopping the data jobs. It makes very easy to create a new on top of it. The front end UI relies that's being open source now, so rely heavily on top of it. And uh, recently, the VMware team that Taco is working on a thing, he will edit the wildcard matching uh, feature to enable to be able to uh, search for job names or team names uh, by uh, wildcard, not just by uh, exact match. Another fairly small feature is uh, uh, the versatile data kit control CLI. Uh, which is uh, used by data engineers basically to deploy uh, data jobs or to run them uh, or to create them uh, most frequently is uh, uh, edit uh, option to specify user agent with uh, default being set this would enable uh, to recognize different sources of deployment uh, of the wind you can have a versatile data kit being used, for example, in quality environment, a versatile data kit being used in working environment, a versatile data kit used on different machines that will enable better telemetry to understand how it's used. Again, this is a feature that was provided by VMware because they want to understand how versatile data kit is used uh, uh, better in their company. And uh, the last two are things that uh, Digo already demonstrated, so I won't be speaking much about it. Uh, new plugin with the Geno box, which it demonstrated very well just recently, and uh, with the Python. Thank you. You can see very detailed post change here. All the quality details, the new contributors. Thank you to Stefan Baudoy, uh, Garitai, who improved our readme, and Delta Michael, who I think is Ilania. Uh, who jo join our team. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, the last uh, thing uh, on the agenda today is um, Postdem, kind of a little, maybe a bit entertaining part. <laughs> so basically, um, uh, yeah. We both, me and uh, Anthony, we were uh, on the Fosdem conference. We met only once for approximately five minutes in this conference. 
So I believe that we are having completely different experience. And um, yeah, basically I can tell a little bit, I prepared like a presentation uh, to tell how was my experience. And then I think also we can uh, ask Tony because I think he saw maybe more technical talks on um, data, big data and uh, um, probably what else was on the, yeah, there were two tracks uh, on the second day, which I didn't uh, visit. So, and also, I know that you were on Kubernetes track, which I visited only like once. So, yeah, uh, this is my personal experience and uh, some, as I said, low quality pictures <laughs> that I took. But, uh, yeah, I hope to at least entertain you. As I wrote down, uh, there are 53 slides. So, a bit about FOSDEM is that basically it's big. It's like a huge conference, and you can uh, know that from like uh, the fact that there are 32 main tracks in this uh, conference. And in total, there are uh, 379 hours of content. So, basically, to watch it, I think you need like a year at least. I mean, it just, just does, doesn't make sense to, to watch everything. and. Because there are these tracks, they are focused on some specific topics and uh, just people have to, when uh, I am there, I usually just pick my tracks or my the speak, speakers that I want to see very carefully. And if it starts bad, possibly running to another room is uh, making more sense than staying there. Or just sitting down and uh, like watching it online, the other one, <laughs> uh, if the room is not full because also the rooms are quite often full so the, the opening and closing looks approximately like this it's a huge uh, like um university where there's just like it's it's full eventually like maybe eight thousand or maybe even more people okay so some talks uh, that i visited uh, the first i just want to highlight this uh the end of free software but uh Eventually, it wasn't uh, that interesting, more like a clickbait, and uh, there are several of those, but uh, some of them actually are good, and I believe that this one also was quite good, ingesting over a million, million rows per second on a single instance uh, by QuestDB. It was uh, actually pretty awesome clickbait, yes, and but uh, actually it, would, it made sense, uh, and everything that he showed was, uh, was uh, on, on point. And another one, and actually this was uh, in a uh, fast data uh, track. Uh, this was like, I think the best talk that I, I saw, it was explanation of uh, streaming and batch processing and uh, in context of Abati Beam. But eventually I really like this because um, the explanation is really nice when the examples are, for example, like, uh, Batch processing uh, compared to Star Wars uh, movies. Entertaining and at the same time really educational and at the same time they are promoting uh, their open source tool. So that is a perfect uh, combination. I believe that is the best talk that I saw. So there was another one that was very kind of entertaining and uh, interesting and all the, I believe, interesting talks on FOSDEM in general, maybe live start with kind of disclaimer like this, that uh, is go goes like, uh, this talk does not seek to analyze morality of who you work for and does not seek analyze to um, companies of any kind. And uh, kind of with disclaimers, it starts um, interesting and it talks about, um, um, yeah, actually who is benefiting from open source and uh, maybe saying that Possibly at the moment, uh, big companies are more uh, benefiting from open source than um, anyone else. And uh, I just like to, uh, yeah, this quote a bit that uh, I think in 2005, they said that <clears throat> the people who work on open source are kind of uh, communists of the time. <clears throat> uh, yeah, and uh, of course, open source is everywhere. And I think this is a uh, complete truth and uh, working uh, in actually, closed or open source projects, I always have uh, worked with uh, open source tools. And yeah, here he's saying kind of that uh, the open source and direction is uh, increasingly the dictated by, uh, by firms. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, there was a very interesting uh, thing happening around GitHub, and actually now open source community I saw is kind of 
intention and uh, kind of uh, doesn't really accepting uh, GitHub talks or GitHub appearing there because it's not uh, open source. Although all our projects, open source projects are there. And, um, but yeah, the, at the moment, uh, I believe that uh, GitHub is trying to really focus on uh, making maintainers happy. I checked out this page yesterday and I tried to register there, but it needs uh, like 72 hours of uh, checking me if, uh, yeah, if, if, I'm, if I'm valid to, to join maintainersgitlog.com. So one more interesting thing that I saw there, and I believe that this is really cool that's happening is open source research and basically research with open data that uh, is available to everyone and uh, some conclusions that uh, can be taken out of it. And there is um, this Linux uh, foundation, they're working with volunteers and um, they are, um, doing some research on open source uh, projects and usage and the uh, people who are doing this. And uh, I really like this talk um, because, uh, yeah, because it get kind of gave very interesting uh, uh, results. And yeah, one of them was that uh, most of the people actually contribute to open source because they consider it to be fun. So yeah, I, I think it's cool. And I think uh, I also agree. And I would agree that uh, as a pure open source contributor, why would I do it is also for this reason. Also Europe. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, 63% of the people of contributors are saying that uh, they are personally interested in project for some reason in order to contribute. And uh, also, uh, this has happened in my life. I have also experienced in, in some projects that I am using and working with some open source tools, but I am not allowed to contribute uh, to the changes. Let's say I'm working with the code, using the code uh, for profit. And then uh, if I'm improving the open source project, I cannot contribute back to it, which is true. And I think also this is kind of sad that uh, it's happening. and. Uh, also, uh, so basically the results are that uh, 136 developers are responsible for more than 80% of the lines of code added to the top 50 packages. So basically not that many people have created most of the open source code. So I believe that this is interesting. I don't know what is the conclusion of it, but, um, but yeah, it's uh, made me kind of curious about it. Yeah, there, there, are, there is also discrimination. I mean, everyone's uh, human and uh, I think this is in general I mean, in the world uh, happening at the moment. So yeah, um, research is a different kind of OSS contribution and uh, yeah, I was kind of um, really inspired by this talk and uh, seeing how open source like say, let's say research can contribute to uh, making this world a bit better place and uh, actually making some useful research in all types of uh, um, um, topics. Uh, then there was uh, in one of the data tracks also this uh, 90s uh, then uh, 2000s and uh, so on buzzword bingo. I like this talk actually it was not uh, my topic, but uh, it was interesting because it was summing up all sorts of things that happened during the time in this kind of visual, uh, nice way. So we see when uh, like big data appeared, where, um, uh, I don't know, devils, for example, agile practices, NoSQL, and uh, uh, what what was the topic of the of these years? And here the doc, Docker and Kubernetes appeared as well. And now <laughs> there is ChatGPT and uh, many things that we don't know yet. So uh, I also visited the community track. There I met uh, this woman, actually, she's from VMware. She's working, uh, she's um, 
one of the maintainers also or like support for maintainers of open source community and she was talking uh, about um, about uh, contributions or like in popularizing uh, open source um, repositories in order to attract more contributors and here there are some uh, resources that I can also share later uh, if you're curious to read them, because I think that those resources are really good, but there is like a lot to read, a lot of documentation to, to read. Yeah, NASA also was there. I want to say it because actually NASA is uh, uh, like giving a lot of money to open source projects that they are using. And of course, they are also then deciding how they, these projects evolve. But uh, yeah. I want. To, I think it's just interesting that they are, yeah, what, whatever they are doing, and yeah, th this is the last talk before the closing, so they really put it in the like uh, highlight. So yeah, then I did a little bit of uh, vandalism with uh, promotion. There is just like a wall with things, and uh, I was thinking to today to propose that we could all come to this. Uh, uh, conference and meet, but we're not going because we are actually going to Eva's wedding <laughs> in Bulgaria at the time. So anyway, this is cancelled. <laughs> so yeah, and uh, yeah, there are several more. I applied actually, Anthony, to this one and uh, I tried to apply to this, but this is actually happening in March. So basically promotion is happening like this. I can draw something and uh, or if anyone is going to Taiwan at some point. Also, there is a conference happening there. So yeah, it's just, a, I think, really cool way also to promote projects. And I put like a little Versta Dead Kid sticker with uh, something that Demira actually created, uh, I think, last year when we were at uh, KubeCon. And actually, stickers were disappearing. I was just placing VDK stickers and uh, like checking back. I had like a pack of them and they're all gone. And also Anthony brought some stickers and they are all like distributed. So people were uh, taking our, our stickers. Uh, yeah, quite, yeah. So a little bit about Power of Reddit because I just uh, saw this there like, and I didn't know what it did. I took a picture, but yesterday I did a little research and I found out that this guy is a Redditor and Uriel, it's, it's just uh, his Reddit name, but uh, basically he became very popular now uh, as he died when he was 30. But still, I think the, the power of his contribution to Reddit is huge and uh, people know him just by because he was arguing a lot and uh, talking a lot and being very, very active on Reddit, which is, I think, a cool um, thing to be remembered also by. Not, not always, I see people are uh, agreeing with him, but uh, he became really popular because he has the, like strong opinions. And then there were like some, a lot of events, of course, Fosdam is like one place where a lot, a lot, a lot of people meet. And then there are all these type of official, unofficial like events after, after parties, parties and so on. And this is just uh, part of Fosdam that is impossible to yeah, ignore. <clears throat> they're allowing to mm, clone their conference and everything that is there. So it is completely open source. And I, I think that this community is really promoting open source as much as possible. Like, uh, um, yeah, just to living by the values of, of open source. And as I say, each year, like, see you next year. And uh, yeah, I hope to be there next year as well, because this is like one of the best experiences <laughs> okay anyway not all the talks are interesting <laughs> but yeah so basically i just wanted to conclude with some conclusions that i have and maybe later i i will write a blog post on this basically i believe that everyone who has ever contributed or thought to contribute to, to open source projects need to go to FOSDEM. I went to FOSDEM first time without knowing anything about open source while I was working and using open source tools. And I didn't know like absolutely nothing about it. And I got really hooked on this community and the idea that people work together in order to spread some knowledge and improve kind of uh, humanity in some way. And uh, 
it used to be when I was first uh, in FOSDEM that it is very cool to be paid by some corporation working on FOSDEM, uh, on um, uh, open source uh, things, because it was very uncommon. Now it's common, so it doesn't, it's not considered cool anymore, or not that cool anymore. But still, I think it's, um, it's anyway, good yeah now yeah now people want to go back and uh, contribute like uh, kind of in a parity way uh yeah there is this github thing that uh, mm, yeah open source people are kind of uh, mm, having some issues with it open source research, research exists i basically learned this just now yeah fast data and actually data was very cool the all the data tracks, I think, were completely full as well as Kubernetes tracks. So I hope that next years they will just create like uh, bigger rooms for for these tracks because uh, basically on the on the outside when the, there is one talk happening inside, there is a huge queue. So when it finishes, some people go out and these people come in. So it's basically very difficult to get into one track and then possibly you have to then sit there the whole day if. Um, yeah, uh, inspiration, of course, is crazy. Like after this, like mm, contribute, like inspiration to contribute is just uh, over the top, I think. And uh, yeah, anyway, and that's it. So yeah, I don't know, Tony, do you have anything to add? Because yeah. That was very comprehensive. So yeah, I this was my first time attending FOSDEM. It's a huge conference. I think the largest conference on open source software in the world with 32 tracks. It was very confusing to be able to choose something. Uh, so I ended up trying to simply to attend one or two talks of a lot of tracks like big data, uh, Java, Go, containers, and so on, uh, just to experience different kind of things. Uh, and uh, it's a uh, pretty interesting experience. Uh, it's a, uh, you can gain a lot of knowledge and uh, certain inspiration from the conference as Gita did. And uh, even develop some valuable connections because there are all kinds of people there that you didn't meet. Uh, but one advice I would give if you want to attend for them is carefully look through tracks and decide what you want to attend. Because trying to decide while you're there, you're just, uh, it's impossible. You have 32 tracks each in parallel going on. Uh, so you're going to make other bad choices. And the campus is big, so you have to actually run around between buildings to go to another talk. Yeah. So make a plan if, if you decide to go to both them. Don't be lazy like me. Yeah, OK, thank you. So yeah, um, yeah to finish, I just want to Again, say thank you to the contributors and uh, potential contributors and Gary also for joining and everyone who is here. And um, I think that the next uh, community meeting is going to be March 29. And I'm going to put it in your calendars and create an event in the upcoming days. And uh, yeah, feel free to give me the topics for the next one. Or we are going to be talking about UI most likely. Yes, yeah. I think we're going to demo and uh, talk about the VDK UI that we are work working on and actually Eva. Yeah, you can say something if you want. If not, we can finish this meeting. I have one question for you guys. Do, do you mm -hmm. plan any integration with Mage? Because I, I don't like this word, but I think that Mage is a true killer of Airflow and it's becoming very hot. And it will definitely help the, the VDK grow in popularity. I've never heard of it. What's Mage? It, it's like the better version of Airfall. It's just. Yeah, what a better version of Airfall. Git, prefer Daxter, Mage AI? Okay. Yeah, yeah, Mage AI. I think I have seen it and I mentioned it several times here yeah, because it looks cool. Yeah, so uh, for all the tools in the market, we are constantly uh, making researches and looking at them. For sure, we'll double check these tools and see how we, we could either 
um, integrate with or yeah we'll, we'll make a research for sure thanks for bringing this today okay so thank you everyone thank you for joining and see you next time next meeting see you bye thank bye. you bye thank you bye thank you bye